Hi, I'm Drew Larson. I am the founding co-owner here at Leaders Beverage and welcome to the Leaders Bar. Here at the Leaders Bar, we do these short videos to help anybody that's in the industry learn. Anybody who's trying to troubleshoot at their bar, uh, learn something or be able to jump online and get a problem fixed without an expensive service call. That doesn't always make us or myself the most popular guy, but our goal is to work together within this industry to raise the level of quality. Because when we can raise the level of quality in the industry and with our beverages, then we all do a little bit better. When we work together, we, uh, we do better together. And so that is one of our big goals. If you're a subscriber here, we want to say, and I want to say thank you very much. Blows my mind how many people subscribe and look at these videos every, every time we put one out. And if you're one of those people who hit that little thumbs up thing down there, that's awesome too, because it really helps us get the word out and it helps us continue to do these types of videos. If you have a comment or a question, uh, please put it below. We do our best to read every single one of them. We try to answer uh, you know, within five minutes, sometimes five days, but we'll do our best to get to it. We will say, and I, I should use the first person, that one, we take our work seriously, our seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. You might hear me skip a word or slur a word. I'm not going to go back and edit a video so every nuance is perfect because after all, we're sitting here talking about beer and beer is fun and it should be a little bit relaxed. So take the, some of uh, the, the mistakes I make with a grain of salt. And with that said, we do make mistakes and we don't get everything right. And not everybody does everything the right, the, the same way. So. What I'm saying here is not the end all. It's not the only way to get to quality. So please, if you're posting below, just be respectful and we'll all learn together. So, so today's short video is going to be five things that might be stopping your beer from pouring. If any of you, like myself, have been uh, at a tower, you can't see this tower because it's behind this white race board. You've been at the beer tower and you pull the handle and nothing comes out. You run around, you check the keg, you did this, you did that, but you're not 100% sure how the system works or your bar back isn't there and you start making phone calls. And on a Saturday night, maybe you can't get a hold of your draft company. So this is going to be five things that you can take a look at on your own to figure out why the problem might be there. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to list them here real quick and then we're going to go through them one by one so you can jump around if you need to and get right to what you think the problem might be. So first, you might have an empty keg. And yes, we have found that out on service calls. And I don't know about everybody, but we don't like charging somebody because we did a service call to find an empty keg. We'd like to help you find that over the phone. Two, you have an issue with the coupler. Some people call it a tavern head or the tap. That's the actual coupler that attaches to the keg. Um, and there's several things that might be going wrong with there. And that's what we'll get into uh, when we go through these individually. Third is the fob. The fob is this plastic looking thing. Um, of course, it might be metal or some other. There's lots of different ones, but you might have a problem with the fob uh, tripped. Uh, another issue is gas pressures might be off, uh, might be empty. So we'll get into that a little bit too, and we'll actually show you on equipment what we're looking at. And the last one is a frozen or blocked line or a blocked line and freezing could cause that. Uh, and we'll go through those too. So Let's start with the empty keg and get into that one. So here we have a keg and this one is empty and I can rock it around this easily. Uh, quite literally, I was out on a call once and they were sure uh, kegs were full and they had no problems. I couldn't figure it out. And what happened was the keg was actually buried behind another keg and they never actually lifted it up to find out. You should know the difference between an empty keg and a full keg. And if it's empty, you're not going to be able to get a, a beer. This keg happens to come from our friends at 18th Street Brewery. We haven't returned it yet, but this was a fantastic uh, Meritzen. So we'll get this one back to them. But in the meantime, let's uh, move right on because this was an easy one. Just make sure your keg's not empty. Uh, let's move on to the next one, which is something is wrong with the coupler. Now, what I'm going to do is show you that is what a decoupler looks like. And in a moment here, I'm gonna zoom in on a kind of coupler that can sometimes get in the way of that, which is the S coupler. You have an S and you have a D, and they look almost identical as you're sitting here looking at them. I'm gonna zoom in on these for you and show you a little bit more. 
So here you have the decoupler. This is about the most standard coupler you'll find, coupler you'll find here in the US. Notice that when it's unengaged and engaged, this is the size of the probe. Now then you have an S coupler, which is often called the uh, European sand key. You notice that the probe sticks up higher and when it's engaged, even higher. I'm trying to get that so you can see it. Boom and boom. So you can see these are actually two different couplers. This is the coupler that belongs on the keg I just showed you. This one goes on to a different type. You can get this onto the D style keg, but it won't work well. So you won't get anything at the faucet or you'll just get a lot of gas and spitting. And then if you have an S style keg and you put this one on it, then you'll pretty much get nothing because that won't push the ball down on the keg. So one thing I actually forgot to mention before we move on to the fob is the actual coupling. On the keg, if the handle's up, it's not actually engaged and it needs to be down. We're gonna be going into the cooler in a moment and we'll show you that. All right, so here we have a keg. The coupler's on it and it's been twisted into place, but somebody forgot to engage it. If it's up, it's unengaged. If it's down, it's engaged. So you'll make sure that's engaged. You'll make sure the keg isn't empty and then you'll make sure all the gas is on and we'll get your beer pouring again. Now let's jump into the fobs. There's several different types of fobs out there and they all work essentially the same. Here you have a, a plastic fob and I'll probably put a picture up here so that it's a little bit easier to see. And what you'll see is there's a white float in there and that float goes up and down. Uh, it's the same thing with if you have a stainless steel kind of uh, you know fob and there's these little thin ones that have more of a uh, little foam, and you can see that goes up and down. That is tripped, meaning the, f the, the float comes down and it blocks the flow of beer. And the reason it does that is to keep the, the line packed full of beer. So when you tap the next keg, if it's the same exact keg, you can just go back to the faucet and start pouring again without a big bubble and having to uh, recharge the entire line. But let's go into the cooler and I'll actually show you what a tripped fob looks like and um, the one that we use the most and we see the most out there and just works well, um, we're gonna show you how to actually reset this particular fob. Hopefully your draft system has a set of instructions on the wall. If not, they're pretty easy to look up and figure out. Uh, and if you're not sure, shoot us a picture of what you're looking at and we'll see if we can help. But let's go into the cooler and see what that should look like. So this is a little louder. There's probably gonna be some background noise as the fan is going. What I wanted you to see here is what a fob looks like when it's tripped. Notice it's not full with beer and that little plastic piece is floating down. This is that little plastic piece, you know, and this one just has no beer in it, but you notice it's down and you have that little piece. So in order to fill your fob back up on a plastic fob like this, you're gonna change out your keg and notice right now our keg is actually attached and ready to go but it doesn't actually reset the fob. Every fob has some sort of way to reset it. On this one, you spin that top up and that allows the fob to pop up and then use the little overflow and that'll fill it back up. Now, as long as we're here, might as well point out, you always want the fob to be completely full of beer all the way over all the springs. You don't want air in there because that one creates a churn and two just lets more air interact. Uh, and even though there's no oxygen in there, bacteria can grow in a nitrogen environment, a CO2 environment. So you wanna keep it completely packed. Sometimes if you're you know, two or three floors up from your cooler, you'll actually run up there, get it pouring before you reset it. And that's the reset. So you wanna make sure your fob is running and making sure that it's actually flowing through and nothing is blocking your fob. Next up, we have gas pressure issues. So there could be a problem with the gas that's keeping the beer from actually being pushed all the way to the faucet. So for example, you might be out of gas. Uh, we've run into that more than once. But also, if you have two kinds of gas, you have nitrogen and you have carbon dioxide that go to a gas blender, that gas blender has to have pressure from both of them in order to work. It will shut down if one or the other turns off. And the reason it does that is because if you ran out of nitrogen, for example, and then started pushing the beer with all carbon dioxide, you would overcarbonate the beer. And conversely, you would undercarbonate the beer. 
So that's a kind of a fail-safe mechanism to know, let you know you're out of one of the gases and to protect the beer. So you want to check that both gas cylinders are full and that it has the proper pressure. Most gas blenders require at least 55 pounds of pressure to operate, so make sure the gauge hasn't dropped down below that. And then another one is that all of the gas switches are turned on. We've often found this gas switch or that gas switch someplace turned off. We will uh, jump over to our cooler and show you some of these things. Okay, so when I'm looking for gas problems, I always start at the source. Now your source might be a big bulk tank. It might be tanks smaller than this. I'm standing up right now. This is just below my chest height. But what I come over is one, I make sure that the tank is actually turned on and it's not all the way off. And to turn on one of these tanks, the nitrogen or CO2, you turn it all the way until it's open and then you back it up just that little bit so it's not tight. And then you check that the gauge right here, that's the, the gauge up on top tells you the amount of pressure that's going outbound. You'll check that and make sure that's over 55. We tend to set ours at about 80 to 100 pounds. And then the one on the side, which is a little harder to see, I can turn it towards you. This is the one that tells you how much is in the system. If this is down in the red or it's pegged down, you might be out of gas. So this is something that you'll want to check. And then this is that switch I was talking about. Every regulator tends to have an on and off switch. What I always think of is that the switch is facing in the direction of the flow of gas. So if it's pointing to the side, which is just a metal wall, there's no gas going. If it's pointing in the direction of gas, we've got gas flowing. But then there's a few other places to check and let's look at those. So now when you continue your uh, travel upstream to make sure all of the gas is working, you could have a couple of different types of gas blenders. Your gas blender could be um, integrated with a machine that looks something like this. It's a little bit larger, it might be mounted on a wall. This one is mounted above the tank and what this is is a nitrogen generator. It pulls nitrogen out of the air, puts it in a tank and that becomes our nitrogen. Well, you wanna make sure that all your switches are on. You know, we have them off because we don't actually use the blending in this particular unit, but we do use the nitrogen. And for us, that would be a switch down here to make sure that was on, because if that wasn't feeding our gas blender, it wouldn't work. And that is this. This is a gas blender, and it can look, a lot, it can look different in different situations. If, for example, you have a unit like this or a big thing mounted on the wall, this could be integrated into it. But this is one kind, and you might see something that looks a little bit more like this, like the little black ones. It might have a gas leak detector in here. But these are your gas blenders, and your gas blenders will also have switches on them that you can turn on and off. So you wanna make sure that the proper switches are on. Now let's go in the cooler and we'll take a look at the switches in the cooler. And here we are inside the cooler looking at the secondary regulators. These are the secondaries because the primaries out there are the primary regulation of the gas. These are the secondary regulation down to the keg. And you'll notice each one has a switch. I bet you guys already know this one's off because it's pointing toward a wall, it can't flow. So that's an off switch and that's all you got to do to turn it back on. We'll keep that one off because there's nothing flowing there. And lastly, number five, you might have a blocked line for some reason. When I say blocked, like physically stopping the flow of beer. And while I keep saying beer, it could be coffee or kombucha, uh, teas, bourbon, you name it. If it's a beverage, we can get through this draft system. Uh, so, it might actually be a frozen line. You'll check your glycol machine to see that the glycol machine is running at a proper temperature. A proper temperature is usually between 26 and 32 degrees. If you see the temperature readout on your glycol machine down in the low 20s or high 10s and teens, there may be a problem with the controller and that temperature has now become low enough to freeze the products in your lines that have the least amount of alcohol because they'll freeze at the highest temperature. If there's water in the lines, for example, and it never got repacked with beer after cleaning and the glycol's running, it could freeze that line. Pretty much the only way to solve that is to turn your glycol off and let the whole system warm up overnight so you can clear that line out and get it turned back on. You might be able to finagle some things with sending some warm water in there, but that could also mess with some of the other lines. So usually you just turn it off, uh, melt out the line, fix it, 
and then call a refrigeration or draft technician to see if they can help you fix the problem with the glycol machine that was letting the temperature go that low. You could also physically have a pinched line. Lots of coolers get kind of tangled up with stuff. Go in there and make sure there's nothing uh, pinched. And then, you know, uh, another one we ran into once was literally a faucet being um, filled, the back of the faucet. So you have a faucet here, and at the back of the faucet, the shank, you know, these come apart. That shank was full of plastic. And what had happened is the beer lines literally through all the trunk in the building had started to peel away and it was going through the lines and getting stuck in the faucet. Now that's a situation where you're going to have to remove the trunk and replace things. But uh, what you do is you take the faucet off and, and check that there's nothing physically right there blocking it because we've seen that too. And if you haven't cleaned your lines in months or it's been shut down for a year and a half, it's very possible that beer has actually dried up, become bacterial uh, laden, and is literally uh, blocking it that way. I hope that nobody ever watching this has that situation, but if you do, uh, look into uh, maintenance of those lines. So when I was talking about um, a potential frozen line, this is your glycol power pack, and it might be, um, might be silver made out of stainless steel, it might be, uh, it might look a little bit differently, but ultimately this is a system that cools down glycol and it circulates it next to the beer in different lines to keep things cold from point A to point B. Well, if your digital readout or, um, and you may not have a digital readout, an analog readout, and if there's no readout, you actually need to get in there with a thermometer and test, test the batch itself. If this for some reason is dropping down way below let's say 26 degrees, it's 20 degrees, it's 15 degrees. We've run into one that was at five degrees. Something is wrong with the electronic controller or the probe, uh, the temperature probe, and it's making this drop way too far, and that could potentially freeze things up. That's what I'm saying. You'll wanna turn it off, let things warm up, and then call a technician who can come problem shoot the actual equipment itself. But if you're not 100%, you should probably talk to somebody before you turn off your glycol, because when you do that, it will slowly uh, make the rest of the beer foamy until you get that one line fixed. Thank you so much for taking the time to look at this short video. I hope it had something in it for you that was helpful or solved a problem for you. If you have questions or comments, please post them below and we will do our best to get back to them. We just ask that you be respectful and remember that we don't all do things the same way. And in the meantime, we wanna say be great to your teams and be a leader.